Chapter 55. I knew it was stupid. The Admiral was right. I should have returned to the base, but I couldn't. Not only because I could hear the stars calling to me, luring me, not only because of what had happened in that place between heartbeats. I wasn't being controlled by something else. At least, I didn't think I was. But I had to know. I had to confront it. I had to see what my father had seen. We soared higher, higher, up where the atmosphere faded, and we could see the planet's curve. Still higher, aiming for that gap between the debris field. I drew closer than I ever had before, and this time I was struck by how deliberate it all looked. We called it a debris field, but it wasn't really debris. There was a shape to all of this, an intent. Enormous platforms that shined light downward, others that looked like the shipyards. Together they formed a sequence of broken shells around our planet, and they had aligned just right to create an opening through them. I passed into that large gap. If I veered too far to the sides, I'd likely be in range of the defensive guns that Cobb had mentioned. But here, traveling through this impromptu corridor, I was safe. As I passed the first layer of debris, Embot said we'd encountered space proper, though he also said the line between atmosphere and space, or the line between atmosphere and not was an arbitrary distinction, as the exosphere doesn't end, but instead fades. My breath caught in awe as we passed enormous platforms that could have held Alta a thousand times over or more. They were covered with what appeared to be buildings, each silent, dark, millions upon millions of them. People lived up here once, I thought. I soared past several layers. By now, we were going at incredible speeds, Mag 55, but without wind resistance, it didn't really matter. Speed was relative in space. I looked away from the platforms toward the end of the corridor. Out there were still calm lights. Spencer, Embot said, I'm detecting radio communication ahead. One of those specks is not a star. I leaned forward as we passed another layer of debris. Yes, ahead I could see a glowing spot that was much closer than the stars. A ship? No, a space station, shaped like a spinning top with lights on all sides. Smaller specks moved about it. Ships. I adjusted our course, pointing toward the station. Beneath us, a platform revolved in its orbit, cutting off my sight of the shrinking shape of Detrius. Could I get back? Did I even care? I could hear them louder, the voices, voices of the stars, chatter that didn't come through the radio and didn't form words. The call of the stars, it was, it was Krell communication. They used that place between heartbeats to talk to one another, to communicate instantly, and, and the minds of thinking machines somehow relied upon the same technology to process quickly. It all required access to that not place, that nowhere. We drew closer to the station. Don't they know it's dangerous, I whispered, that something lives in the nowhere? Don't they know about the eyes? Maybe that's why we only use radio, I thought, why our ancestors abandoned this advanced communications technology. Our ancestors were frightened of what lived in the nowhere. I'm confused as to what you mean, Embot said, though the Krell are using some, sub, some normal sublight communications in addition to the superluminary ones. The ordinary ones I can crack and listen in, working to translate. I slowed Embot, passing ships that turned toward mine. These didn't appear to be fighters. They were boxy, with large open windows at the front. In that moment, something hit me like a physical force. It crawled inside my brain, making my vision fuzz. I screamed, sagging in my straps. Spensa, Embot said, what's wrong? What is happening? I could only whimper. The pain and impressions. They were sending images. They were, they were trying to overwrite what I was seeing. Engaging stealth and jamming, Embot said. Spensa, I'm reading unusual signals. Spensa? The voices vanished. The pain evaporated. I let out a long, relieved sigh. Don't die, okay, Embot said. If you do, I'll probably have to make Raj my pilot. It would be the most logical move, and I both and we both hate it so much. I'm not going to die, I said, leaning back, tapping my helmet against the seat's headrest. I do have a defect, a hole inside me. Humans have many holes in them. Would you like me to provide you with a list? Please don't. Ha ha, that was humor. I have a hole in my brain, I said. It can see, it can see into the nowhere, but they can use it against me. I think, I think my father was shown some kind of mind hologram. When he flew back down to Detrius, he saw what the enemy wanted him to. I remembered what he'd said. I will kill you. I will kill you all. He'd been so mournful, so soft. He thought the humans had lost, that his friends were already dead, that what he'd seen hadn't been reality. When he blew up his friends, I whispered, he thought he was shooting down the Krell. A small number of the boxy ships approached and bought in the blackness. They struck me as couriers or maybe towing devices. Through the wide glass fronts, I saw creatures that looked vaguely like the drawings we had of Krell. 
dark forms in, in armor with red eyes, only here they were bright colors, a perky blue and red, not dark at all. They reminded me a little of the pictures of crabs I'd seen from, from old earth during my ancient biology courses. And the armor they wore seemed more like some kind of living apparatus with open plates on the head portion for the creatures to see out of. The sides of the little ships were stenciled with what looked to be words in a strange language. Ketos red, Redgor Erthen Listro Listrins, Embot said, reading the words. Roughly, in English, that means penitentiary, penitentiary maintenance and containment of earthlings. Scud, that sounded ominous. Can you tell me what they're saying? There's some radio chatter near the station, he said, but I suspect these ships are communicating using faster-than-light cytonic devices. Relax whatever you're doing to shield us, I said, but don't put it down entirely. If I scream again or go crazy, put it back up. Okay, Embot said. You already seem crazy to me, but I guess that's nothing new. Awareness returned to me, the voices in the darkness of space. I could hear their words, the ones they were sending through the nowhere. I knew them, even without needing a translation, because in that place, all languages were one. It's looking at me, one of the creatures was saying. I think it wants to eat me. I don't like this at all. It should be incapacitated now, a communication returned from the space station. And if it's looking at you, it doesn't see you. We are overriding its vision. Tow the ship in for study. That's not a standard DDF model. We're curious how they built it. I don't want to get anywhere near it, said one another one of the creatures. Don't you know how dangerous these things are? Curious, I looked out of my canopy at a ship drawing closer. Then I made a kind of growling face, baring my teeth. The creature screamed and immediately turned its ship around and fled. The other two tugboat-style ships backed away. This is a job for fighter drones, one said, not manned ships. They sounded so scared, not like the terrible monsters I'd always imagined. I relaxed in my seat. Would you like me to try to hack their systems, Embot said. Can you do that? It's not as easy as it might sound, he said. I have to piggyback on an incoming signal, then decrypt their passwords and create a dummy login, then transfer files while spoofing an authorized request, breaching local data defense lines, all without tripping any of their alarms. So, can you do it? I just did, he said. That was a very long explanation. Beginning data transfer, and they caught me. I've been booted, and security protocol is preventing my re-entry. Lights flashed on the station, and a moment later, a squadron of small ships ejected from one of the bays on its side. I knew those flight patterns. Krell interceptors. Time to go, I said, grabbing the controls and sweeping us around. Do you think you can navigate us through the debris layers without triggering any of the defensive platforms? Supposedly, the Krell do that each time they attack the planet, he said, so it should be possible. I hit the overburn, launching us back toward the outer layer, outer layer of debris. Embot put some directions on my canopy, and I followed. Tense for a little, for the first bit. We skimmed close to some of the platforms as we weaved toward the planet, but none of them fired at us. I felt strangely alert. The sense of fascination I'd experienced earlier, the draw to seek out what was causing the stars to sing, had faded. It was replaced by stark realism. Coming out here really had been crazy, even for me. But as we wove past another layer of debris, the Krell interceptor fell back. It seemed, increasingly, that I'd be able to return to the planet safely. Did you get anything, I asked, from their computers? I started with the station's core orders and worked outward, he said. I didn't get much, but ooh, you're going to like this. What? I asked as I hit the overburn, flying back down toward Detrius. What did you find? Answers.